everybody. Welcome to the MI Conversation Series presented by Loudwire and Ultimate Classic Rock. This gentleman that we have with, Happy New Year, by the way. This is our first one of these, 2019. This gentleman that we have here, um, when it comes to the guitar, I mean, there's, you know, there's just a few people that you name and he's always on that list. So I don't think I need to give much of an introduction, but you know his music has been in countless films and television shows. He's put out so many records. He's put together such important treks and tours. He was the teacher for a bunch of other guys who were on those lists of greatest guitar players. So ladies and gentlemen, Joe Satriani. Oh my God, I, I don't have a guitar, I just realized. <laughs> don't worry, but there's some here. <laughs> Good. <laughs> How is everybody? Good? Thank you for coming out. It's, right, it's Thursday night, right? Yeah. All right, I'm, I'm impressed, thank you. Yeah. That's great. How are you? I'm fine. I'm, I'm more than fine. I just had some really great rehearsals this week, yes. and we just did another uh, G4 camp, which was great. So uh, I'm feeling really good. And the rehearsals, can you talk a little bit about those? Yeah, I'm doing another experience. Uh, you know, I have no mic technique. I'm sure you've noticed that already. I feel like I should be doing this. How do you do that? Six inches. Kind of, yeah. Kind of like. Somewhere in that. Like this. I've got like news reporter. Day, yeah, okay. So, yeah. Professional. I mean, the Lemmy is always. Oh, like that, yeah. yeah. So, like I was saying. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I'm doing another experience, Hendrix Tour, which is always a super challenge but so much fun to do and uh, I had this crazy idea to get Doug Pinnock to sing and play bass and uh, Kenny Aronoff to play drums and it was really magical uh, just sitting there with them the last two days playing the music it's a lot of cool things started to come out uh, of our backgrounds you know that we didn't know about the musical backgrounds and that's where we kind of coalesced and, and I think there's going to be a lot of magic on that tour uh, nice. when we hit the stage. Nice. I was telling you this uh, backstage before we came out, but I grew up in Indiana, so Kenny Aronoff, you know, was the drummer for John Mellencamp for many, many years, and he's just like a you know local hero for people that grew up as Hoosiers. Yeah. And then of course Doug from King's X, um, who's actually been, he came to the Rob Halford uh, MI conversation series that we had mm -hmm. here. Um, just such a sweet guy too. Such a nice for someone who's had so much talent oozing out of him to be such a yeah, he's counter. a total superstar i mean he's yeah he's got that thing and yeah i don't know if you've read uh kenny aronoff's book but the book is amazing any professional musician would find his book fascinating just the steps that he took to be so good to be such a great proficient musician to learn how to work in the industry and just the multitude of crazy stories like we were talking about backstage, things you don't think about, uh, but that you should all be prepared for. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> just the general insanity. That and he's so versatile too. I mean, he, he did yeah. like a Smashing Pumpkins record and yeah. you know, stuff that just, yeah, all over the map. He great, great set of ears, you know. He really can listen yeah. to an artist or a new band that he's getting plugged into and figure out their peculiar groove or you know the sensibilities they like to bring on stage and then he can somehow plug himself in it's great I love talking about the Hendrix thing because that brings us you know we, we do these you know kind of career retrospectives and going all the way back to the beginning here mm -hmm. and Hendrix was such an important part of your development and career and your launch into everything that you know became your life yeah um, talk yeah. to me a little bit about you know Jimi Hendrix and uh, how and when and where that lightning bolt sort of yeah, entered um, your life? So I grew up, I'm born in 56 and grew up in Long Island and I was youngest of five kids. And so they all went through some of the best musical periods that you can think of, really seminal periods where new things were happening. And uh, it was a very musical household. My parents listened to jazz mostly, but they I think they played a lot of classical because they thought we were... It's good for our brains or something like that. So I heard that growing up and I watched my sisters and my brother 
uh, have great parties playing uh, anything from uh, 50s rock and roll all the way through the British Invasion, Motown, soul music, and the beginning of rock. And I think I was a test subject for my siblings. Uh, you know, generally, if you're the youngest, you get fed all sorts of funny things under the table and, and, and terrorized by your older brother <laughs> if you've got one like I did. Uh, all in good fun and love, I'm sure. But nonetheless, you know, you live vicariously through these older siblings, which you think are just, you know, gods and goddesses that every, all excitement revolves around them. And part of that was this music that I thought was so wonderful sounding. And I loved hearing, you know, Coltrane coming from my parents' room in West Montgomery, and I, and I loved hearing classical music being played through the house. Uh, and as I would visit my other siblings' rooms and I would hear Chuck Berry or the Rolling Stones or James Brown or John Lee Hooker or then uh, The Who and Cream and Led Zeppelin and Hendrix, uh, I started to find what I thought was my music, what really resonated with me. And so for me, the number one was Hendrix for some reason. I have no really good explanation for it because I, you know, I had like a brain like this big, right, back when I was a little kid. Mostly flesh and bones and hormones, right, when you're young. Not a whole lot of intellect going on. But you know what you like, right? And so first time I heard Hendrix on the radio, it was a mystical experience. Felt like there was a DNA change in my whole body. And I think my siblings found it fascinating that their little brother would somehow respond to this. So they fed it to me, like, you like that? Oh, here, have an album. And the, their, you know, my sister's uh, boyfriends would come over and they'd say, oh yeah, you like that? How about this, you know? <laughs> you ever heard of Electric Ladyland, you know? And, uh, and it just sort of went on from there. And I was kind of like a, a I was weaning myself off of being a failed drummer. I started at nine. I took lessons from a jazz drummer. A really nice guy named Mr. Patrikas. He used to come over and give lessons in the house. Uh, fantastic. Uh, wow, and was that lessons for all the siblings? No. Just you? Just me, yeah. <laughs> I'm not really sure where my parents met this guy. He was right out of central casting for a hip, jazzy guy from the 60s, you know. <laughs> Um, cool. But he was so nice, and I was just a little, you know, little kid that, that really wanted to make noise, and I did make a lot of noise. It wasn't necessarily good noise, and that was the problem. So as I started to notice that the noise that I made was not uh, as good as Mitch Mitchell, uh, you know, or John Bonham, I thought, well, maybe I ought to ease up on this thing, and I wasn't really thinking about guitar. Uh, one of my sisters was a folk guitarist, so I, I saw the guitar in the house, I watched my sister practice. I watched her perform at her high school. Uh, I thought it was really great. I loved the, f the fact, I was impressed with the fact that she could take a guitar into a corner of a house and very quietly play music. Mm. Whereas I had to announce that I was going to practice and everyone would flee, you know? So very different, difficult when you're a drummer. But the day that Hendrix died was traumatic for me. and. For, for again, for reasons that's hard to really put into words because I wasn't an intellectual being that you know logged it all in. Yeah. I just thought this is a horrible event, and what am I going to do without that music in my life? So I thought I'll play guitar. That's what I'll do. I don't know how, but I'm just going to do it. And uh, that was the beginning of painful process <laughs> of being a beginner. Everybody knows that process. It's just it's tough on yeah. the soul when you realize how bad you suck and you just, <laughs> you're looking at, you know, years, uh, decades of trying, you know. Um, but th the wonderful thing about being really young and being very inspired is that you're kind of deaf and dumb to the whole thing, you know, what you really sound like. You're sitting there trying to play an F chord. It sounds like you're strangling a small animal, but you go, I'm still going to get it. I know I'm going to get it. And it happens. and. You know, you cut yourself some slack, some much needed slack when you're young, so. Yeah, uh, and, and at that, and like you said, you know, you're such a bundle of bones and flesh and hormones that just mm -hmm. getting any kind of sound choked out of that thing is. It is, it, but it happens fast. One, one thing I learned when I was teaching was that you could teach an eight-year-old a Metallica song really fast. But when a 40-year-old came, 
they're generally they're coming from their job mm. and they've got lots of responsibilities and family whatever and they want to learn the Metallica song it's really hard to work against a whole life of not playing Metallica <laughs> right and because they as a, most grown-ups do we all we see the negative side of things instantly along with the positive side but an eight-year-old just doesn't even doesn't even think about it it's like I want to play that song show me how to play the song I will play the song that's the way they think. They come in, they put their toy men on the amplifier, <laughs> and they look at me like, okay, I'm ready to receive the magic now, you know, that kind of thing. And it, it changes yeah. as the student becomes a teenager, they start to, you know, their, their world gets a little bit larger and they start to embrace uh, other things and they start to question. So it's a great period to learn when you're really young. It's, it's fantastic. Uh, w when you're just talking about physically being able to excel at this new difficult task. That's why students are young. Yeah, uh, you I wonder know. if that's even similar to learning a language, right? Because, uh, you know, trying to learn a new language at age 40 versus age four. Yeah. You know, it's a, a world of difference. So, yeah, I never really thought about it that way in terms of you've got a lifetime to unpack and deprogram to get somebody back to that basic level where they're exactly, yeah. open. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Um, now you have a vow at the end of your last name, and it's the uh, 20th anniversary of The Sopranos this week. <laughs> um, and you're from the East Coast. So it was a big Italian family, I'm assuming? Yes, Yeah. absolutely, yeah. The, the family sort of came over around 1906. And, um, so you're like second, third generation? Yes, yeah. Cool. Um, and uh, just Manhattan, basically, and then started to spread to the Bronx. And, and so, yeah, I still have relatives all throughout there and, and back in, in the home country as well. Yeah, yeah and such, a, obviously, a, a passionate people and a musical people. And it's interesting uh, to hear oh, about... By the way, you know, all people are passionate and musical. Remember, we, talk, we were backstage, we were talking about India yeah. and, and my travels through India doing these tours. And... Uh, it, it is true, no matter where you go, there's funny stories about getting to the gig and you know all the other things that revolve around doing a gig. But the one constant, no matter where you go, is people love music, they're passionate about all the things that all human beings are passionate about. So it's a great thing to keep in your mind while you're screaming because you can't get across the road. <laughs> like the story about the U-turn, you know, it yeah. makes no sense, right? But once you get over that, you go, that's right, this is, as magical a place as Cleveland, Ohio. It's going to be a great <laughs> show. Yeah, and Once everyone's there for the same reason. They yeah. are. Yeah, yeah. yeah sure. Um, yeah, it's just so it's so interesting to me to think about uh, as you're describing all the different kinds of music that was in your household mm -hmm. as a kid. You know, like you know, your parents knew a cool jazz guy, and and you had people give you know showing you Cream and things like that. Like, yeah. um, do you think that was a, a common experience? And you know, other kids that you knew and went to school with, and or was that unique to your family that it was so oh, broad and, and no, diverse. No, no. Uh, we grew up uh, in suburbia, um, and so you know, on my block, it it was you know like m most suburban areas on the East Coast. It was kind of like the United Nations. You had friends whose grandparents still lived in the house, mm -hmm. and they came from all over the place. And uh, there were a lot of kids back then. Maybe on my small street when I was five years old, there may have been sixty kids uh, yeah. that would get you know kicked out of the front door by their parents <laughs> like get out of the house and don't come back until I yell your name you know that kind yeah. of thing it's, a, it's you know idyllic uh, way uh, um, uh, of raising kids back then but uh, compared to now there were no play dates nothing was arranged it was you know they, they really would send you out and say survive and come back for dinner and that kind of thing <laughs> yeah. but there were so many other kids I mean w when you're small you don't realize that the the next kid up is kind of watching over you, and then the next kid above that is actually watching over you. Mm. And, and so uh, the, w w I guess we all took care of each other somehow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and talking, you know, while we're still sort of in the, the childhood days and obviously talking about Hendrix and that, that turning point mm -hmm. um, for you as a musician and kind of with what you were going to do, where did uh, science fiction enter in? Because, uh, you know, of course, everyone thinks of the iconic Silver Surfer album cover, and of course, uh, Star Trek, and different things that you've referenced. Um, you know, we hear a lot about uh, your musical influences, and those of us who have seen a lot of interviews with you and listened to podcasts and things like that. Um, 
I'd love to get into the sci-fi thing a little bit while we're okay. here. Um, I'm just curious about when and where that, that you know, because for some people it's like I'm just into music or I'm just into cinema or I'm just into, you know, and it seems like you're m more of a well-rounded person when it comes to uh, the arts. Well, themselves. thank you very much. But, um, all right, I don't want to burst your bubble on this whole thing about the alien thing, but... Um, so, well, growing up when I did, there were, you know, science fiction was popular on television, and uh, so there's that. And but we had a healthy uh, uh, attitude and disrespect for whatever we were being told, uh, including, you know, that there were alien beings. Of course, if you've never seen an alien being, then why would you ever believe there there was one? You know, uh, this is a sort of like an important thing. All other aspects of life, we demand proof. You know, uh, but for some reason there are these other areas where people just say, oh, I'm just going to believe that. It's like no one's ever proved it, but I'm just going to take hold of it. That in itself was fascinating to me, the culture around it. Mm. You have to keep in mind, my father gave me the double helix when I was like seven or eight years old to read, you know, but I barely knew what, exactly what he was trying to get me to understand. But um, it was coming from a scientific mindset that got me fascinated in the culture uh, behind there being aliens. Hmm. So let's fast forward a little bit to high school. I'm with this crazy band and um, we're rehearsing upstairs in his parents' house and every once in a while when we decide to take a break, the, the mother would make us sandwiches or iced tea or something like that. Uh, and so we'd be down there and the TV would be on and this is back when there were just a couple of channels uh, out, out of New York and they'd be repeating this movie over and over again and it was the worst and funniest black and white uh, science fiction show that I'd ever seen in my life and we found it so funny that we memorized it and it became a joke and we, you know, just at the, the drop of a hat if there are any more than two of us out at a party or in school or something, we would go and we would recite this uh, this film and, and laugh just because we thought it was so funny. This movie was called Not of This Earth. Okay, so you have to remember that. So I left New York, I toured with a disco band for a few years. I go to California to find myself or give up music or something. I finally decide to do an album and I realize that I've lost track with my band, my high school band. And so it got into my head that if I called the album Not of This Earth and my address was on the back of the album, <laughs> mm -hmm. that they'd find me because no one would be stupid enough to use that as a title for an album, right? So I did, and I did get a call, and, and uh, I'm happy to say that every tour since then, we always get together. <laughs> and, and so that worked. But, so, but of course, I got myself into this corner here because once I started to go out and tour, this is the first thing someone would ask thing. So, do you believe in aliens? Have you been abducted? Are you not yeah. of this earth? And I'd go, am I gonna, like we don't have 15 minutes for me to tell this whole high school story <laughs> right. about that yeah. it's a joke and, the, and I don't wanna make the interviewer feel bad. So I just go, oh yeah, okay, yeah. 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 Star Trek, you know. Hugh, Hugh X-Files conspiracy <laughs> guy. Yeah, for, for me, I'm not so much coming from the perspective of, uh, you know, the, the UFO type people. And to me, it's more, I, you know, I love like Jack Kirby's artwork and, mm. you know, all that when I see the Silver Surfer and things like that, that's yeah. where I think about is the, the art side of it. You know, more so, the, well, there's this, you know, there's been good things that have happened from this accident, this funny accident, this humorous accident. And so... If you fast forward to the second record, that the full length record that I put out, uh, there was a test period where the guys at Relativity weren't really sure if they wanted to fund a, a, a record, a Joe Satriani record completely on their own. Because I had uh, produced uh, the first record with my own record company and it was a P&D deal that I was doing with Relativity Records. So I show up there and of course I'm looking like the way I do, except with a bad haircut. And the president says in front of everybody in the company, he says, you don't look like a rock star. And, and I'm, I've, I'm just laughing because I, I knew that, right? And he's expecting like Steve I's cousin to show up, right? Because yeah. you know, he knows that Steve and I have known each other since yeah. we were kids. So he just figured I'd walk in six foot one and the whole <laughs> thing, you know? 
So I'm going, Barry, no, that's not where I'm at. No, no. So I play a couple of songs uh, that night at the China Club, and, and uh, one of them, Satch Boogie, and it does something in his brain. So he decides, okay, I'll give you money to do this album, and I tell him what it's going to be about. Celebration of guitar, upbeat, n nothing negative, and by the way, nothing negative on the album cover. I made a point of getting that in the contract. Because there was a, they were doing business selling the most grotesque a album covers I'd ever seen in my life, and I said, "That's, I don't want to do this." So, such as? <laughs> well, I'm not gonna. Whatever. I just mind? anytime yeah. there's like gratuitous violence uh, <laughs> gotcha. and and stuff like that on an album cover, and they're doing it just to outdo each other, right. which is what they were doing. It was innocent, you know, yeah. but still at the same time, I thought I don't want that ever to follow me around, so I'm just not going to do that, right? So a couple of months later, they're very excited about what I've recorded. I do an interview uh, with an English journalist who likes the record. And at the end of the phone interview, he says to me, too bad about the title. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, Lords of Karma. He said, how come guitar players always get all Indian-like, you know, once they learn how to play? You know? He just, I really didn't understand what he was trying to get at. I just thought it was a, interesting title so I said goodbye and, the, and then I called up the label and I said I just had the funniest interview and did have we actually gone into production yet right so Jim Kozlowski was the guy I was talking to uh, he was production manor, manager at Relativity and Jim is like six foot four he's got long platinum blonde hair and he says to over the phone he says well you should put the silver surfer on the cover because that's my nickname and I said, what's the Silver Surfer? Now, this is because my parents never allowed comic books in the house. Mm -hmm. So I had no idea what Marvel was doing. And I, yeah. you know, we, were, we had the Double Helix and James Baldwin and you know, all sorts of books in the house, and, but n nothing like that. And, so and is that, was it because comics were lowbrow or was it the comics were seditious? And I think they didn't want me to hang out at this place in town where they <laughs> sold comic right. books. I'm, n okay, I'm not really sure. sure. There's a whole thing, you know, when, when the immigrants come and they finally get a shot at the American dream, they really try to control the kids. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and it's out of love, but it's, there are some funny things that happen, like the comic book thing, you know. So, uh, so he, of course, he goes, what? Like, you don't know who the Silver Surfer is? And I go, no. So, I, of course, I said, this isn't some evil dude. He's not, like, chopping up nuns <laughs> on, on the cover of the comics or something. And uh, he says, no, I'll send you, I have originals from 68, I'll send them to you. And of course, I fell in love with the imagery and I read the story, the Norrin Rad, he's you know, metaphysically uh, challenged, you know, he's mm -hmm. full of angst, and I thought, this is great. Such a positive, cool image. And Jim was living in Manhattan, uh, down the block from Marvel, so he just went down there and made a sweet licensing deal. Because wow. the, the character was dead. I mean, the comic book sure. was completely unsuccessful. And, and so they were like, yeah, five grand, 20 years, done deal, you know? So I wind up with this cover, which is a great cover. But w look what I've done with this whole Joe and the Alien thing. I've just, <laughs> I've really yeah. doubled down on this thing. Yeah. And it's like, oh, no, now I got to talk about this. So, but I was... You know, after I did that phone call with the, the journalist, I, I w went down every song and I, you know, I'm like, Crushing Day, not, not a good title for an album, Satch Boogie, stupid title for now, <laughs> Always With Me, Always Now, Too Long. And, you know, so I went all the way back to the beginning and I thought, Surfing With The Alien, of course, everyone's going to know I've got a sense of humor. Right. So let's right. do that. Right. So that's why I mentioned that yeah. to Jim and that's why he said Silver Surfer. And then, so here we are today. I know you expected me to come out all silver. Oh yeah, right? totally. On the surfboard, <laughs> yeah. I thought I actually thought Galactus was going to be behind you, yeah. and eating planets. You never um, know. You never know. Yeah, and it's great. And, and, and to me, that's you know, as a kid, at first discovering that record, part of what stood out to to me was the sort of whimsical nature of the album title, and, and every, that was the first time I discovered you was through that record. And um, and I think that's the case with a lot of your fans. Um, especially at a time where, as you said, a lot of the environment, everything was dark and mm -hmm. scary and violent. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, and it was fun to like, have a you know, guitar record. That yeah, yeah. It was fun. It was. It was, it was up, fun. Upbeat. Like John Cunaberti, my Positive. engineer and co-producer, 
swears by alien invasion and and believes that he had an encounter hmm. so he would get me into more trouble like when he came back from a, a a, a mixing gig in England, and he had recorded all this radio chatter. And uh, at one point, we were saying, like, wouldn't it be cool if we did have a spaceship? That would be kind of fun, wouldn't it? Just sort of in the beginning. And so we called some guy who had samples of jets, and of course, it just sounded like you're at the airport, you know? So um, he said, well, I got these recordings. Let's just put them on there. And it was just a mixture of European languages that neither of us spoke, so we thought it sounded alien, you know? <laughs> But I think it's just like Dutch and you know Belgian French and stuff like that. Yeah. And um, but we thought, oh, that sounds cool. Yeah, aliens landing. He's hearing you know, transmissions, whatever you know. And so we just went with. I mean, it's really old school lo-fi stuff. Yeah. <laughs> whatever eight-bit samples of stuff, you yeah. know, uh, in an emulator. You know, you're just kind of doing that kind of stuff. So. Yeah, so much fun. Uh, you mentioned Steve Vai. Um, yeah. You know, of course, uh, it's always fun to talk about Steve Vai when yeah. you've got Joe Satriani. <laughs> um, and, I mean, the, you know, I, I referenced it uh, in the introduction before you came out here, uh, but the list of guitar heroes who have uh, been associated with you or studied under you, literally mm -hmm. taking lessons from you, yeah. is, you know, it's like a guitar magazine full of, of these great players. Um, who are some of the people that you felt over the course of your career and especially early on that you learned from the most in, in terms not, not just in terms of ability and skill and technique and all that sort of thing but things that you took from them that you were able to use as a teacher mm. you know what i mean I'm, I'm curious about i mean did anyone teach you how to teach uh probably uh have my mother being a teacher her whole life uh grammar school um made it seem normal because there was always a part of the house that had a desk and teaching materials and every Friday all the teachers would come over and have cocktails and complain about their students and their superintendent whatever it was just a whole it was a fantastic scene you know they had some of the best parties ever uh, so I just thought teachers are cool you know this is great um, but yeah when I got the idea that it, that I could teach because somebody saw me play at a high school dance I'd been playing less than a year, but I thought, well, I know it, you know, my mom's got some paper and a ruler and some pencils over there. Maybe I can write something down that I learned two months ago. And that was really the beginning of teaching. I was just 14, about to become 15, and I was teaching kids like Steve who were 12 and who maybe played a little accordion, which is, you know, if you're Italian growing up in New York, <laughs> So there's an accordion somewhere in your history. So um, <laughs> my my uncle, my father's older brother, was a professional accordion player his whole life. Wow. And for some reason, never in the house. I think my father hated it so much, he was like, never bring that thing in the house and, you know, pollute my children with that <laughs> thing. But um, my uncle Gino did have a photographic memory for music, which I do not have. He could scan a book of manuscript, close it, and do the gig. And I think that's why he played his whole life until he was about 90 years old. Wow. And fantastic, you know. And it's a hard gig. Someday, guitar players will be shunned like accordion players. Maybe it's happened before, I don't know. But uh, to keep your gig going that long and raise a family and have a decent life is pretty amazing. Because yeah. again, you, you have to remember, you get to play music every night, which is like the greatest gift ever. So once you push all the business stuff aside, it's a real gift if you can stay a musician your whole life, you know. So, so, how, so how did that, you know, uh, being 14 and teaching 12-year-olds mm -hmm. how to play guitar, how did, how did that evolve then into, you know, suddenly you're on the West Coast and um, taking on, you know, these students in Berkeley and San Francisco? So as a teacher, I was so lucky. It was a little, um, I mean, it's, it sounds funny to think that I'm just in my house doing nothing and, or I should say my parents' house, I'm just a, you know, idiot teenager, and some other little kid knocks on the door <laughs> with a pack of strings in one hand and, and a stringless guitar in the other, and he says, you know, we saw you play at the high school dance, can you teach me how to play guitar? And I'm like, oh, you little ugly little kid, get in here, you know? sit down over there. It just happened to be Steve I, 
back when he was shorter than me, you know? <laughs> I tried to... A treasured memory of yours. <laughs> yes. But, you, you know, you do learn from teaching. It really is funny. I would think that you, you, uh, you would learn if you had, a, like, a classroom like this every day and, and maybe you stuck with the students for four years in a college or something like that um, or high school experiences or something like that. But there is something about one-on-one, -on -one, and uh, even though it might only be a half hour or an hour, uh, there's a desperate need for the student to learn as soon as possible. Everybody knows that this, the moment is fleeting. There's something about preparing to be a musician that makes you feel like time is of the essence. You know, I gotta learn this now, you know? And uh, I have to become famous right away <laughs> maybe not now but how about tomorrow you know there's <laughs> there's a lot there's a lot of emotion and intensity and angst that comes into the teaching room as a teacher you have to learn to diffuse it and figure out what are they good at what are they not good at what can i maximize what am i just going to let alone you know mm -hmm. uh if the student is a race car driver and he comes in and he says i just want to play some credence clearwater then that's what you show them how to do, you know? <laughs> yeah. And if it's an eight-year-old kid and the mother says, will you just take this kid, you know? <laughs> Focus this yeah. all of energy somehow? I'm, I'm going to tell you a funny story. I, that ex was exactly the thing, right? So I'm teaching at this place in Berkeley, California, second-hand guitars. Jane Hunter is working on and off from her home. She comes in. She's a brilliant luthier, so she's fixing ancient Martins and, and stuff like that. One day she comes in and she goes, Joe, will you, take the, will you take Charlie? He's driving me insane, okay? Will you just teach him how to play guitar or something? I'm just leaving him. And she goes off, right, with a handful of guitars. <laughs> and I'm looking at Charlie like, hmm, <laughs> get in here, all right, let's see what we can do with you. And of course it became Charlie Hunter, the Charlie Hunter, right? So it's important when you're a teacher that, you, you know, ev even though you want to tell the kid just sit outside and eat some Cheetos and leave me alone, yeah. that there might be something in this kid that is so unique, that is so different, and in a million years I wouldn't have thought that Charlie, little Charlie, was going to turn into the Charlie Hunter. But I thought it could happen, so I'm just gonna watch and see what he's good at and, and maximize that, and I'm gonna make him learn all the notes and the scales and the chords until he says, you know, I'm out of here, which is mostly, that's what most students do. They get mad mm -hmm. and they leave obscenities, that kind of thing, you know. But I usually only push a student if they tell me that they want to be great. Mm -hmm. If they come in and they say, I want to be the greatest guitar player, I, I say, okay, buckle the seatbelt, here we go. That's what it takes, right? It just takes total commitment, complete, and, and that has to do with the thing that no student wants to do is to admit what they're no good at, to admit what they've just decided to put away. Like, I don't need to know about chords. Who needs to know about chords? Mozart never took lessons. I don't need lessons. Or, you know, B.B. King never took lessons or something. There's uh, so many excuses. They should have a Bible of musicians' excuses, <laughs> right? And you just find the one you use. I go, oh, that's mine. I used that for six years. That was great. <laughs> but, so that's, you know, I love teaching it because I didn't have to do real work, you know. I didn't have to become a nurse or dig ditches or do really dangerous stuff. I could still keep my calluses and my, my nails at the right length and all that stuff. I mean, it's, you think about it, like I said, it's a privilege if you can play music every day. A little bit hard on the fingers if you teach six hours a day and then you rehearse with your band and then you play three or four shows a night. I mean, there is a, th thing of too much guitar playing, you know, so, but you have to monitor your tendons and your muscles and all that stuff. But way better than washing dishes. That would have, <laughs> yeah. that would have been bad for the calluses, you know? <laughs> yeah. better, better for your body than roofing. That's uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you were, you know, talking about some of these, these students of yours and being in the Bay Area, you were kind of right there at the epicenter as the thrash metal movement mm. was evolving and happening. And of yeah. course, some of your students were in bands like Possessed and Exodus and um, My Pal, Alex Skolnick was one of your yeah. students at one point. Amazing. Um, and of course we have to talk about Kirk Hammett. Yeah. Uh, one of the, you know, 
perhaps one of the most famous lead guitar players alive. Yes, yeah. Um, he's talked about before that you were, you know, a hard ass teacher. Yes, yeah. Uh, but that he went from being petrified of the amount of work that you wanted him to do to then suddenly going from one lesson a week to two. Yeah. And, wanting, and really coming in and um, uh, talk to us a little bit about obviously Kirk, but also just that sort of music in general and as a guitar player, your approach to trying to sort of almost make sense of it. Because I know you were instrumental even in, you know, Kirk coming to you with Kill em All stuff going, uh, some of these songs are in like different keys within the same song. Yeah, like yeah. What, what's that? What do I do here? Uh, how do I write a solo over this? Yeah, um, yeah. Well, that was definitely, they were writing new music. That whole generation was writing brand new structures and no one had really soloed over it, so they weren't quite sure exactly what they're supposed to do. Like, just like imitate Michael Shanker? Is that going to work? No one <laughs> right. really knows, right? Yeah. Um, the key was, it wasn't my job to make the decision. I was already too old. I was in my 20s, so I was too old. You know, I, it was over for me. You see it when there's a 14 year old who is inventing a new genre, mm. you know, and, and uh, so I had to just step back a little bit and. Um, you you have to imagine that you know uh, Kirk's mother's coming in, dropping him off. Uh, when Larry Lalonde is taking lessons, his girlfriend and his girlfriend's mother are sitting in the other room, Amazing. and and his girlfriend's doing homework, and the mother is the manager of the band Possessed. You know, yeah. Uh, so it's kind of a family yeah. atmosphere. It's it's not so of course like Larry went on from Possessed to Primus. And yes, yeah. yeah. So, um, and then of course I told you about the, you know, the Charlie Hunter story. I mean, it's very yeah. familial. It's, it's a friendly atmosphere. Um, th there's no tuition, there are no dorms or anything like this. These people have real lives that are going on. But they just happen to be, like you said, on the cusp of this new movement. Um, all of the students that, y that, that have names that you recognize were so dedicated to becoming great. They just, they surprised me with how hard they tried with their good taste, how different they were from each other. Uh, uh, even though they were going to the same high school and sometimes in the same grade. Um, but they, you know, uh, David Bryson from County Crows would come mm -hmm. in right after uh, Alex Skolnick. Yeah. And he'd be followed by Kevin Cadigan from Third Eye Blind. Right. I mean, <laughs> so there's no way to teach them the same way. Mm -hmm. You look at their strengths and, and you, you ask them, what is it that you want? You know, do you want to be the fastest lead guitar player? Do you want to be the best writer? Do you just simply want to understand chords or harmony or something? Um, I was always surprised by what they really wanted. And, uh, but it was my job to give it to them. So. At the end of every lesson, after I would lay all this stuff, I'd say, you realize you have to decide. Don't do it the way I did it. It's, uh, you know, it's, I'm doing it the way I do it, but you don't have, it's, you know, it's completely malleable. You just take these 12 notes and do something brand new, whatever you want. There are no rules. There's just cause and effect. And it seemed to work. You know, it worked with Steve I earlier when I was, yeah. we were both really just students. I was just, you know, whatever, eight months ahead of him. Uh, and, and so I figured I'll just continue that. That's what my high school music teacher did with both me and Steve. He, you have to imagine, we just look like heathens that only like mumbled Black Sabbath in the hallways, you know what I mean? And he went to Juilliard, right? This is Bill Westcott. But he would sit us down at the piano and he would say, now shut up and listen to what I'm gonna tell you. Look at this note and look at this note and look what happens when I play that, those intervals against that bass note, look what happens when I change the bass note, how does it make you feel? And I don't know, you know, how many months it took to get through to us, but he did get through to us because he was a dedicated teacher and he was a good human being. So that is an important thing that you learn when you're young and you take it, and when you see a young person in front of you, it clicks and you go, okay. When Charlie's in front of you all of a sudden, you're remembering yeah. sitting at the piano and Yes. Yeah. And you go, I get, that's my job now. Cool. Yeah. Um, you, one of your students was uh, Rick Hunholt from Exodus. Yes, yeah. Uh, was Kirk in Exodus around that same time that you were starting Yes, he him? was in Exodus. Um, boy, how long? That's such a distant memory. It would have to be a good number of months because when I met him, he was the guitar player in Exodus. Okay. And then 
yes. And then all of a sudden he said, I got, got this the call, yeah. opportunity to do this thing. April 1st, I think, as the story goes, because he, he thought it was an April Fool's Is that right? <laughs> yeah, and they called him on April April 1st. And so just we amazing. When he came back and he brought me that album, I was, wow, I was just, it's crazy. You know, it's just, it's, but it was a beautiful thing. Uh, it was an interesting moment because in the Bay Area there was a clique of, of musicians who thought they were what was happening. Mm -hmm. And they all had different jobs or no jobs, but I had this very unique job. And I was teaching these young kids uh, like Rick and, and, and Kirk and Charlie. And I, so when we get together, I'd say, no, you know, what we're doing is not really happening. You know, we're getting hired at the local club because our fans drink hard alcohol. <laughs> That's why you get rehired at a bar, mm -hmm. you know, or even at a, at a club. If you're a band and every time you sell out the house and your audience doesn't buy any hard alcohol, the venue loses money. And it's just a hard fact of um, the reality of, of trying to make money as a club owner. So the musicians, of course, they, they don't understand really the economy of what's going on here. It's a very unusual thing. The, cl the club owners are in an entirely different universe than the people jumping around on stage thinking they're clapping, we're great, <laughs> we're going to the top, you know? And uh, until the club owner says, you know, your audience drinks white wine, forget it, you know? <laughs> I'm, hi I'm hiring the comedian who slices watermelons because everybody yeah. drinks tequila or whatever. So, uh, but I, I just knew from teaching the kids that they really loved music, they had something to say, which is so extremely important. They were, they, had, they loved music, but they were also angry, just the right amount of angry for the new generation to be, to say, we're not gonna play like you. Know, like you. No disrespect, Joe, but we're not gonna play <laughs> like your band. We've got this other thing going, and it was a beautiful thing. So as you, know, as you mentioned, that big, almost sort of final lesson that you have for each of these students was, you know, <clears throat> now that I've given you all of these tools, go build something of your own, like make, you know, don't just build what I built. Yeah. Um, what were some of the things, I mean, you've had, we obviously could be here all night because you've had so many important records over the course of your career. What were some of the things that you felt uh, was your responsibility almost to contribute to guitar playing and to, to rock music? And you know, when, when, you, when you look at the, the landscape of it and you yeah. go, okay, what, what wouldn't be here if I wasn't here? You oh, know? I don't know, I don't, there's no responsibility. I, I wouldn't think that. I wouldn't ever put that on a student to say they're responsible to the world to do something uh, other than to be truthful, you know. To, to have something to say though, like you were saying. I, you know, I think um, I think it's a um, it's a good rule of thumb to think that uh, if you're not bringing some sort of original story to your to the world, eventually they will get tired of you, maybe right away. And um, so there is that, in, uh, on the one hand, it's, it seems impossible to say to somebody, you know, go in the room and become original. Um, there is no book for that, you know, and, and it's a silly request, right? However, I would say the opposite, which is, you know what, you can't help but be original. Everybody in this room is a total original. And so you just have to figure out how to use that. That's what people are interested in. If, you know, I go back to my hotel room tonight and I open up any site that's trying to sell music to me and it says, you know, we have a thousand new records that are all competing for the same message. They're all saying the same thing, you know. Why would I push play on any of them? I mean, that'd be torture, right? But if you see an, an original story there, somebody who's stuck their neck out, excuse me, to to tell their story, whether it's commercial or not, that interests me just as another human being. I'm, I wanna hear what it is. I wanna know why they're playing different than the way I play. And, but when I'm not being a musician and a guitar player, I feel like I'm, I'm avoiding you guys. I've, I don't mean to. <laughs> is this, you're all the way over there. I, I feel like I'm only looking at these yes. guys. So. Sorry about that. <laughs> but, um, uh, that's what I'm interested in as, a, as a, a, a consumer of music. I'm really looking for 
something to truly surprise me. And I would assume that, you know, when people heard me play, for some reason, I can't really claim responsibility for it. I have to admit it, there's a difference. Mm -hmm. I can say, yes, I'm not like everybody else. I've tried, but I can't help myself. Like, <laughs> so in spite of my being not commercially ready for prime time, uh, yes, people are buying this record and they're liking it and they're playing it on the radio. But it's a beautiful thing when you get recognized for being on the outside and then they bring you in. Uh, so uh, you might as well do that because when you're on the inside, everybody's doing it. There's professionals there and, and I think people just, they dispose of you right away. It's like the... It's like that whole thing about being on TV too much. If you're available on TV, then why would anybody go see you anywhere else? Because it's free on television. Yeah, and I, I feel that, like, and that's such a great point because I feel like the artists who really endure are the ones that built something outside of the traditional yeah. system or the, the gatekeepers and sort of forced a shift where the mainstream came mm. to them, people like yourself, bands like Metallica. Uh, where rather than catering to, you know, whatever was happening at radio or MTV or in the touring and club business, just building your own thing out, just being what you are and until it becomes, uh, you can't ignore it, you know, and then the, <laughs> yeah. the rest of the center sort of moves in your direction. It's, it's important to, to admit, at least it was important for me to admit a long time ago, that there was no reward for good behavior as a musician like the outside reward. To look for that, you know, to say, I practice eight hours a day, I bought the black jeans, how come it's not working, you know? <laughs> it just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. It never happens that way. So if you think that it's gonna happen that way, then you're kind of putting yourself into a, a real stressful situation. And from there, you'll make probably bad creative choices. But if you admit, I love what I do, and I know there's no reward for practicing Lydian dominant in every key, <laughs> harmonized in seconds. <laughs> like Laughs of recognition. <laughs> yeah. You know, like when will I ever make money doing that? Like when will anyone stand up and go, oh, wow, I can't believe he did that. It's like we know as students there's a lot of stuff we cover. It'll never fly in the studio, on the stage. Good luck even selling it to your, t to your students, you know what I mean, when you pull this thing out, like, hey, Lydian dominant, harmonized in seconds, every key, go do it for the next three months, call me when you're ready, you know. So, but there is a beauty to knowing your instrument. There's a beauty and a satisfaction to being one with music and the intervals. And when that happens, you can appreciate just doing it and, and how lucky you are to play music. And this outside world is a whole other thing. This is where when you have guys here to talk to and they tell you funny stories like trying to get out of the, the gig in Pune in the car and the, the U-turn and all the funny things about the runners we were talking about. These things are actually, you can learn. They will be useful in your life. Way more than, you know, in the real world than studying the Lydian dominant you know, in every key harmonized in seconds. However, I made the choice to learn that because of this guy named Lenny Tristano, who was a bebop piano player from another era, another century, who was a, a, just a special human being and he made me do it. And if I made a mistake, the lesson was over. I literally had like two one minute lessons wow. where I would just be so nervous because that was the first part of the lesson was, okay, show me the scale. And I'd make a mistake and he'd be like, why'd you do that? And he'd walk over to his Braille accounting See book. See you next time. He, he was blind, so he'd go over to the Braille book and he'd just wait to hear the $20 <laughs> drop <laughs> on the table. I'd walk out and there'd be a whole, like 12 other students there. They'd look and they'd be, don't worry about it. Happens to everybody, Joe, don't worry about it. See you next week. And then sometimes if you didn't make a mistake during those parts of the lessons, you'd be improvising for 15 minutes and he'd be walking around his house. He had this old Victorian in Queens and you'd be sitting there like on the 34th chorus of some jazz tune. You're going, when is he walking in the room? Where is he? <laughs> and he'd come back in and say some real 
you know, down and dirty jazz lingo thing that would go over my head and whatever. But I, I learned the thing from him, which was like, are you a musician or are you not a musician? If you're a musician, you have to learn everything. And if you don't know what note to play next, don't play it. Why would you play a mistake? And then more than once he said to me, you know, Joe, the kids from the suburbs, they're stuck in the subjunctive. You have subjunctive disease. And I, I didn't know the word back then when I was 18, so I was like thinking, I was like, is, what, do I, do, what is, do I have you know, lesions on me? What was he talking about, my fingers? And he says, no, you're always thinking about what you should have played, what you could have played, and what you would have played. And you never play what you want to play. So why don't you just play what you want to play? And you think about it, and it's like, oh, wow. How do you do that? Where there's no book. It's not like going to the music store and getting Joe Pass chords and actually getting smarter in 15 minutes because you've got this beautiful chord book. No, it's just Lenny saying, just play what you want to play, and that's it. No judgment while you're playing. Be in the moment. It's a very bebop zen kind of thing. He also added that after a successful lesson, he said to me, uh, he said, uh, Joey, that's pretty good. Maybe in 15 years, you might, you might be half decent, you know? <laughs> I'm thinking, 18 and 15 years, I'll be so old. It's like, <laughs> uh, but I think 15 years later, Surfing with the Alien came out. That freaked me out. But, um, Clairvoyance. But I, yeah, I feel that. I feel the old lessons. Uh, they were with me, Bill Westcott, and, and even though I took lessons from Lenny for about two months, and then incongruously I went out on tour with a disco band and completely squandered like everything that he taught me in a way, but I, I didn't get to use it, let's put it that way. I just had to wear funny clothes and play some rhythm, but I did make a good living, so there's that. <laughs> Beats digging dishes, as yes. you alluded to earlier. Yes, I still had the guitar around me every day, so. Um, one thing I, I wanted to get into with you, what, we, what I've got you here is, you know, we hear a lot about, in particular for, you know, those of you who are students here too, uh, you know, th there's the business of making music and trying to do it as a living, and we hear so much about the changing industry and, you know, and record stores are gone and nobody buys CDs anymore and, you know, all, all the stuff we've heard a million times. I think in many ways you're some, something of an innovator in terms of developing these different revenue streams and sources for yourself as a musician that weren't just dependent on radio and MTV and selling physical c records and tapes and CDs. Uh, you know, whether that's some of your early explorations with sync and licensing and getting your music into, you know, TV shows and movies and things like that, um, to also creating these branded tours that are, you know, still running and still successful and relevant right now um where did that come from did you did, did you get a sense that there you know maybe the records and tapes part wasn't going to last forever no no i uh so i was in a band called the squares which in a roundabout way i'll, t I'll tell you how this relates to your question directly um from a 79 to 84 power pop band in the, in the san francisco bay area uh most successful most unsuccessful, hardest working band ever. Maybe that's the best way to put it. And uh, so we went nowhere, basically. That's a fancy way of saying we failed. However, we rehearsed in this uh, dangerous warehouse, and uh, right outside the barn door was a dumpster for, uh, was it Nolo Press, I think? And um, they were famous for doing books for Do Your Own Divorce, start your own bakery, this kind of stuff like that. So we'd be out there just smoking, having a drink in between rehearsing. And uh, I'm looking through the dumpster. <laughs> it's not like I'm crawling in it or something like that. <laughs> I've never actually crawled in a dumpster. But I, I have, you know. So I'm in there, just I'm looking at stuff and it says, and so I pull out a book, it says start your own business. And I'm thinking about it like, oh, that's interesting. I don't have any money, but, but I'm gonna read this book. And then it says, you know, publishing company and it lists all the different companies you could make and so I thought I'm gonna take this funny little book home now these books had tear out pages 
with current up-to-date forms, pre-internet, so forms would last for years before they were updated. So, now this book was obviously a reject, but I didn't know that. I don't know why it was a reject. So I took it home. I'm reading this thing and I just get this great idea. I'm gonna start a record company. I'm gonna start my own publishing company. I'm going to learn how to uh, keep books. I'm gonna keep it legal. I'm gonna make a recording and I'm gonna try to sell it. And then I thought, this will be interesting to do, let's say, during the Christmas break or something when the band was taking a month off. So that's what I did. Uh, called a friend, I said I'm gonna do a record with just guitar. No bass, no drums, not calling any of the friends. Just use your little 16 track studio. So I created this uh, 12 inch EP, first mistake, but we'll get to that maybe if you ever invite <laughs> me back. Um, and then uh, it was all guitar, you know, scraping, bumping, just, just making weird noises, no keyboards, no bass, that kind of thing. And um, I, I, I have this record, it's, it's an eponymous release. It's called Joe Satriani. It's on Rabina Records, named after my wife. I happened to live on a street called Ward Street, and my apartment number was B, but it looked like I lived on B Ward, so people thought I was a mental patient or something. <laughs> Added to the appeal of the record, perhaps, I don't know. Uh, most people played the 12-inch EP at 33, uh, w even though it said play at 45 RPM, so this added to my mystique of being very strange, right? <laughs> Playing very slow music. And uh, anyway, I think I had to print up 100 of these things. Um, I was like reading- minimum orders. Minimum orders, way. right? Um, uh, and my resources for this was a magazine called the Sonic Option Network, which was filled with hundreds of like-minded crazy people like me around the world. So I was sort of emboldened by this group of people that I'd never met that are putting out the weirdest records. And so it was a total, you know, do-it-yourself project. I had the record, I don't think I sold more than 10. I gave the rest away. I literally would put them in mailers and mail them to Germany, Buffalo, San Diego, wherever, to record stores that were listed in the Sonic Option Network uh, back pages. And I'd say, I'd explain myself, I'd make a little note, play at 45 RPM, please, if you can remember, <laughs> and you can sell this and keep all the money, I don't care. So that was the beginning, and I, I thought, okay, that was an interesting experiment. I'm a businessman now, by the way. I'm a record company owner, yep. <laughs> as a matter of fact. And, a, and, a, and a publishing uh, magnet. Honcho. Mag yes, yeah. Honcho, Honcho, I like that. Um, and I'm also the, the only artist, so I get all the attention from the label, which yeah. is great. And, and, and also, <laughs> and, and, and you're also handling fulfillment and publicity and marketing. I mean, and, yeah. It's great, the total control over, uh, you know, a pile of dirt, basically, just <laughs> not much. Um, but, so here's a funny thing that happens. I know this is a, a long story, I apologize. But, so I'm, I'm rehearsing with uh, Bobby Vega, amazing bass player from the Bay Area, and Mingo Lewis, who at the time was a difficult person to get a, a, along with, but an amazing musician, and a, a woman named a Ariel Bond, who was a great keyboard player and singer, uh, a local musician. And we're taking a break, we're in this basement place in the Mission District, and, uh, and, so, and so all of a sudden I hear, hey, you're famous, right? And I go, what do you, what do you mean? And he goes, well, this, there's a, your record, you have a record out? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> I almost didn't want him to hear it, you know? <laughs> and he says, well, it says here that, you know, you're an avant-garde artist that has, you know, created a record that is blah, 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 blah. It was just one little paragraph. And I'm looking at that and I'm going, he thinks that's who I am. He doesn't know I'm stuck in this basement in the Mission District waiting for Mingo to show up. And, and I just, I said, wow. I said, hey guys, you know what? I'm, I'm gonna quit. <laughs> And I think we should all take our equipment out right now. And everyone was like, yes. And so that's how weird the situation was. So we all just like snuck out with all our gear and left. And it was all because of that little EP. And I kind of felt bad for Mingo, but we you know, explained the whole thing later. But the next thing that happened was me trying to record what I thought was a real record. So I called Jeff Campitelli. I said, I want to do another record. And he's like, why? The, the last one, like you sold 10. And I said, Yes, before then, I sold zero. So <laughs> things are, they're looking up. 
Yeah. And I had this review. And uh, you sold 10 times what you did before that. Exactly. Yeah. That's right. amazing. Huge. Right. So um, so then I, I get this. Uh, this brings us to the not of this earth record. But the story behind getting that done is just as weird. I don't have any money. No one in town will give me spec time. I go home dejected. There's a letter in the mail. It says, Dear Joseph Satriani, my full name, because of your good credit, we have given you this free credit card and these five checks, and you can write the checks for the limit right now. It happened to be $5,000. And I had zero credit, but this was the 80s. That's what they did, right? The, the rate was 19 and three quarter percent, I think it was. Okay, so, but to me, that was like, hey, I can, I can handle that, right? So I got back in the car, I go visit John Kunaberti, and I said, what if I paid you in advance for a project that we're going to agree right now is gonna take X amount of hours? And I went to the studio head, and I said, if I pay you in advance, can I get a cut rate, and I'll come in two in the morning, work till eight, that kind of thing. So. I spent all that money right there, writing these checks, and I made that record. <laughs> this is so crazy. So, so now, Rubina Records now has two releases under its belt, right? Yeah. So I'm really, I'm a mover and a shaker in the recording industry. And Rubina industry. Records is at least $5,000 in yes. debt. Yes. So I, I sent a copy off to Steve I, and he says to me, you know, uh, these guys in New York just signed me for Flexible, and your record is nowhere near as weird as mine. You, let me introduce you to these guys, right? So I said, sure. But I was thinking, you know, there's no reward other than me loving this, so I'm, it's, I'm cool if it goes nowhere. Uh, but it does go somewhere. I meet Cliff Coltrary. He loves the record. He fights with his own label for the next year to try to get it released. In the meantime, uh, the day that I get a call from the collection agency because I can't pay off this debt, I get a call from the great Kin Band pleading me to drive over immediately and help them finish their record. And the money they laid on me that day was way beyond what I owed the credit card company. So all my problems were solved and I suddenly had this gig where I could make more money to then fund uh, promoting this record and getting this all the way through the, you know, to, uh, to get relativity to release it. It did take a year and three weeks after it finally got released was the story where I was in New York and Barry Coburn was looking at me very displeased at my visage and uh, uh, but Satch Boogie won him over and and it's just I reflected on all of that back in the hotel room in Manhattan that night when I realized I have a deal to make record number three and I can't believe how I got here but it yeah. was kind of like what you said before it's not like I had this grand plan that I wrote out. I just felt in my gut that it was the right thing to try. Because if I didn't try, it would be 100% failure. So yeah. you might as well try. And so. Yeah. Oh, it's so amazing. Um, mm -hmm. Guys, we're gonna start taking some questions from y'all. Uh, my name's Nova. Hi. And I'm a huge fan. I'm a writer and pianist, so nothing to do with guitar really, but you were my first concert when I was 13. Oh my I was God. like front row, like looking at you. My mom got me tickets, so you're my first concert ever. <laughs> so I'm a big Wonderful. fan. Um, but I, I would love to hear inside your process as a writer a little bit. Mm. Um, yeah. You've written so many things, like melodically. I'm such a melody lover, and your right. melodies completely move me. What is it that usually triggers? Um, is it a feeling? Is it just sitting down and saying, I'm going to write today? Um, yeah. I just want to know a bit into for how long you've been in this. Yeah, well, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I write based on the emotion of the moment, and it could be uh, an experience with a person that I've known forever or someone I just met. could be someone I don't know that I'm observing. It could be something I'm looking at online, reading about in a book. It can be real, can be fake, imagined, fantasizing, whatever. Um, I don't discriminate, and it, even if it's silly, I'll write about death. I'll write about s silly moments of having fun, imagining something stupid like an alien coming down and wanting to go to the beach. It just makes no sense. However, if it resonates with me for some reason, uh, I'll follow it, 
because it's a, I always figure it's a gift when you get an idea, you just hold on to that thing. Do not let go of it, whatever it is. Any way you have of remembering it is valid, so just get it remembered somehow. Um, the, there are songs that come right away. They just immediately, you know exactly what the song is. You wake up in the morning and it's in your head or you're just sitting around tuning and you hear a note and suddenly it comes to you. I've also had songs that have taken 15, 20 years to write because I didn't quite understand what the little riff or the chord sequence really meant to me. Um, it's not unlike life where you miss so many opportunities to understand uh, people or things that you do until you mature and then you say, oh, that's what they were saying or what that's what they were doing um, for me. Yeah. It's good to have a hat. <laughs> but yeah, so it's easy when, if you, if you let yourself go, then it goes into the music. And thank you for all you've put into yours. Thank you. Do you wanna go over this way? Hi, Joe. Uh, I'm Santiago. I'm from Peru. Hi. Um, I actually went to see you in Lima and in Buenos Aires, so I'm very happy to see you here again. Oh, wow. That's great. Um, and just to continue with, with the question a little bit, um, uh, how much would you say uh, your collaborators in each album uh, help in the, like in the creative process, uh, the people that you work with, um, like influence the writing style of each album? A lot. Oh, man. I wouldn't be anywhere without the good friends to like tap me on the shoulder and say, you know, that was really stupid, you know, or I don't get this song at all, you know. In a band, it's normal. Like I can say my experience with Chicken Foot is just what you would imagine. It's just a free for all and nobody holds anything back. So the writing process can be really fast because everybody's throwing something in and immediately saying, I won't play that, I won't sing that, or you should play better, or you should sound more like that person or something like that. All in good fun, all just to try to get the music to pop. You can imagine if I'm spending two months in the studio working on guitar instrumentals that it's a, a little bit more solitary, right? And if I'm building the tracks at home, then I really have to rely on myself for most of the process. But my work with, uh, let's say, Mike Fraser and John Kuniberti, extremely important. I've made most of my records with those two guys. They have completely different ways of supporting, uh, but also not letting me play bad. Or if they notice that I'm not comfortable with something from a compositional level, they'll bring it to my attention and say, you know, maybe you should rewrite this. We shouldn't be recording this right now. Or uh, you know, looking for something else, you know. Uh, I'll give you a really quick example. Uh, I noticed when we were backstage there, you were playing uh, Shockwave Supernova, and uh, I hadn't played that in a while, uh, and it triggered a memory of me sending the demo to John Kuniberti along with all the songs and saying, this is an idea I have about a concept album. And so he, wrote some great notes about all the songs and then he went to that song and he said for some reason there's something not engaging about this song like you haven't r reached out and really told me what the song is about yet so I looked at it and I thought well what is it instrumentally from an arrangement point of view that is not engaging and I realized that the whole band is playing all the time it's a great fun playing and it was a big wall of guitar drop D tuning and distortion and echoes and everything. But then I thought, oh, that's right. It's like maybe it just sounds like a big racket to someone who's not actually touching the guitar, right? So I thought, okay, then I'm gonna write a part that is, that is 
a summation of the harmony that's in the song, except I'm gonna figure out a way to have it play by itself. So I came up with the verse. And then of course, once I wrote the verse, I realized, how could I have written the song without this in the first place? And how come I didn't notice that it was missing somehow? So that's a good example of how a trusted collaborator, you know, was just sort of pushing me because he knew he could and that something might come out of it. So, yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, great question, too. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, Joe. I am hi. Joe, too. I'm from Mexico. Great. And I just want to tell you thank you because I met you when I was 14 years old in, your, in the album Live G3 when you play with uh, Eric Johnson, Ibai. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I just want to tell you thank you because you changed my life because after to meet you, I never heard a guitar player like you are. And I enjoy it too much to be here in front of you because I know that you are not only the guitar player that we meet. I try to play because I'm Mexican and I'm learning to speak English. Yeah, I, have, I know that I have a lot That's of kids good. speaking, but uh, thank you, for, uh, Joe, because you are uh, influenced for Latin American, like my friend to Peru and other places, because in Mexico we have a different way to, to listen to music. So, this is my reason I moved a lot of miles to came here, and I am glad to meet you alive, and thank you so much, Mr. Joe. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you. Hi. Hello, sir. Uh, thank you for being here. My name is uh, Jose. I'm from Guatemala. And my question was going, you mentioned already about writing music for your solo project versus the a band. Yeah. Do you have any preference? Do you enjoy one more than the other, or do you have more fun with one than the other? Mm. It's so much fun. Uh, both of them are so much fun. I think like anybody else, there reaches a point sometime when you're on tour, and you might think like, I'm getting sick of this, I wish I could you know, go do something different. I think that's just a typical artist's uh, makeup. You know, once they, they go through a cycle of desire wanting to create and then they struggle with it and then they finally create it and then they just want to drop it off on the side of the road and go do something else this is part of what we do that keeps we uh, keeps all of us moving i think but um i think there's uh fun to be had in both of those situations they're certainly different uh i'm not really cut out to be a front person and that's the one thing I noticed when I've worked with people like Mick Jagger and, and Sammy Hagar and Ian Gillen is that they were born to stand in front of an audience, you know, with a microphone. Who that's are all those guys you just mentioned? What, what <laughs> it's really remarkable, you know, so uh, that, there's so much to explore there. Um, but there's nothing like, you know, traveling halfway around the world and you play a melody on your guitar and the whole audience sings it along with you. Um, that's, that really gets to you. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Hi, Joe. How you doing, Hi. man? How you oh, doing? This is real. I never thought that I would be able to just one day see you in person and ask questions. This is crazy. <laughs> ask uh, away. <laughs> oh, okay. So I just want to share one thing with you. I love all of your songs. My favorite guitar player of all time. Like, I have your post posters everywhere on my wall and your T-shirt. Thank you. So uh, there is a song you have, um, If I Could Fly. Mm. And so that song, um, any time I was about to go take something really serious, like let's say test to t uh, take a test, high school test, whether a soccer match or everything, before that, I would listen to that song. And every time I passed, every time it keeps, it kicks some ass. <laughs> it's crazy. I don't know. It works. It still works. I put that song. It's like, yeah, today I'm going to really be good. So wow. I just wanted to share it with you. <laughs> uh, my question is, um, yeah. I think most people are actu actually asking about writing about you. Mm. I want to know your opinion. Uh, do you actually believe that writing can be taught? Like, can you teach writing? Can you do that or not? Well, you can certainly uh, teach some of the building blocks that are the obvious things. Like if you say, if you, if you want your audience to feel that the melody belongs with the chords, then the melody should use the notes that are in the chords. This is just like a simple thing. So imagine you're in a movie theater, you're watching a horror film, 
and there's a little baby walking down the hallway for some reason, walking. It's got a big kitchen knife and there's blood all over its face. Just think about that for a second. Now, this is, this is the moment where the soundtrack almost always goes to an out of tune, broken piano playing what seems like 80% of a melody that we know from childhood with a couple of flat this and flat that thrown in. It's a typical way of pushing those buttons that make us feel uneasy. Because after all, it's a cute baby with a knife. They shouldn't have a knife. And they've got blood all over the room. So right away, everyone goes, that shouldn't be happening. Somebody save that baby. Or that baby's coming at me and it's possessed. It's going to kill me, right? So uh, it, it's so obvious. I usually bring up the whole thing about Jaws because it's the most famous two notes ever that if they were some other two notes, it wouldn't probably be as menacing, but those two notes a half step away from each other, that's just human nature, you know, that that would put us at ease. So those things are easy to teach. You can get books and you go to school, and, but the way that it's taught, I think the examples and then the subtleties of it, is, th is this is where it can be extremely interesting uh, like the background story of the, the, the baby walking with the knife, this is something that's an opportunity for the story writer to come up with some subtlety that the composer might want to know about. Some more of, like, an, more of an imagination, right? Yeah, well, so like, wh what is the baby walking towards? Is it walking towards you or is it the viewer or is it walking towards the mother that somehow sprained her ankle and, and she doesn't know what to do with this possessed baby? Or is there the worst monster ever in the world and for some reason the baby's gonna be the one that kills it? So are you rooting for the baby or are you frightened of the baby? This also was, you know, if you're sitting there and you're supposed to write the music, you're gonna think about this like, how do I turn this around? Because it's the, you know, it's the monster slayer. Now the baby is the monster slayer. So it's not this out of tune piano thing where it's total psychotic breakdown of reality and you've got a baby who's gonna murder everybody in the house. This is, I don't know how I got off on this tangent, but. <laughs> We're into scoring now, it's great, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. But I go, I'll, I'll go down that rabbit hole for hours if you want, you know. It's, I find it really fascinating that, because if you, again, if you're just gonna write a song called Energy, then you know what you do is you just don't write about all those other things. And, and I think that's the key that a, a teacher, uh, if you're taking a composition class, can help remind you to limit your tools to the job at hand as a way of getting started. You know, no, no one's gonna tell you exactly how to write it, but they're gonna say that you, know, you could start off, you know, if you're writing s music about something that's slippery with stuff that sounds slippery, right? Or if you're writing about a brick, like what's it going to sound like, you know? So, um, but I, the imagery of the, the the baby with the knife, I just see that all the time in horror films. It's basically something good with something totally wrong on top of it. So we know that as musicians, you play a C chord and you put a C sharp on top of it or something, and you know something's wrong, you know? <laughs> sure. I love yeah. that idea about the what sort of picture are you trying to paint, giving that to, to someone as opposed, you know, his, to his question about how, how can you teach writing. Also, my favorite story about the Jaws theme is that when John Williams sat down on a piano, played those two notes for Steven Spielberg for the first time, Spielberg thought he was joking. <laughs> That's <laughs> here great. Here we are talking about it. <laughs> hey, um, my, my name is Mike Georgia. I, I'm native of California. I've been a huge fan since I started playing. You're probably why I picked up guitar. Oh, wonderful, thank um, you. Yeah, you know, I love playing, I love writing, recording, and um, as an artist, it's the creative side that you know I love, but I've always struggled with the business end. It's like pulling teeth, you know, how do I find management or help or booking or PR and all that. It's, maybe it's a rejection thing, I don't know what it is, but like, any tips on just how to like uh, develop my career as an artist on the business end? Uh, there are plenty of books out there that are great that need, you know, they need to get updated like every year because the music industry changes so fast. But Some of the books can be found in dumpsters. They can, <laughs> if dumpsters still exist, whatever. But um, 
Um, this Business of Music, that's still a title, I think, that is published maybe by Billboard Press or something. Um, is that right? You guys know that book? Somebody? Yet yeah, there was a Yelp. Yeah, when I was young, I was given that book uh, by my brother-in-law, and I found it really fascinating. I had to read it over and over again because it was over my head. And a lot of it doesn't apply to a young kid starting out. But even if there's one chapter in there that makes you think twice and, and say, this is important, I should get my stuff together here. Um, I, I think it is important. As a matter of fact, the, you know, one of the things that you run into if, when you run into older musicians is you run into a lot of bitterness, and a lot of it is because of ignorance. Um, and, and that's sad because it's so easy to become informed. It's just so damn easy now. I could understand it in my day when you had to go to the library to get a book or something like that. And, but there's just simply no excuse for not looking for information now and, uh, because you can get it immediately. And so at least you can be informed so that you won't, uh, you know, you won't fall victim uh, to people who are trying to take advantage of uh, your rights as a writer, you know, that's an important thing. But you have to get used to the language and the language that these people are going to use with you when you're trying to make a deal of some kind. Um, but all that aside, that stuff is easy to, to learn about. I have to say that you you definitely that be good to people and uh, that's the thing you got to do. You got to have friends, not, not connections. You know, that's a whole different thing. That has a sinister thing. It's just you have to make friends and uh, every opportunity you have, you should make the friend, even though you're not going to, you know, get something from it other than the friendship. Uh, this is extremely important because as you go through life as a musician, you will depend on each other. And that's so important, you know, it's just, can't, you can't yeah, uh, you, you discount that enough. You didn't give 12-year-old Steve Vai guitar lessons with any sort of foresight that someday he would say, oh, I've got this record deal situation where I can introduce <laughs> you to the guy. But, yeah. That, but those, yeah, when you do things for the right reasons, you know, just people being good to each other. Yes. It can pay dividends, those I, relationships. I think so, but you have to temper that with the, the sad fact that there's no reward for good behavior. There, you know, because if you, if, even in the back of your mind, you're thinking, this is going to pay off. You know, if you believe in karma or something like that, I don't. I just. I think that's destructive. I think you're kidding yourself. You'll talk yourself out of practicing or something because you're banking on this idea of karma. I'm going to help this person, and so it'll come back to me, and everything will yeah. be fine. Therefore, I'm just going to watch TV tonight instead of <laughs> practicing. You know, there's always an excuse. It's that Bible of musicians' excuses that you know we fall back on. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> hey, Joe. Hi. Um, well, this is surreal. <laughs> um, my name is Amrish. Uh, I am a student here studying guitar. Uh, before going to my question, I would just want to mention that uh, six years ago when I got into playing guitar, Always With Me, Always With You was one of oh, my wonderful. most inspiring tracks. Wonderful. And uh, being from India, I always had this curiosity. And just out of curiosity, I just wanted to ask you, what was your uh, inspiration behind writing The Golden Room? Oh, uh, it's pretty simple. Uh, my wife had this idea that um, if, there, if they had a, we made a room that was golden, that it would be a safe environment for sort of like uh, like safe from negative vibes from other people, you know. And um, it, it was you know she wasn't crazy about it. It was just like it was a kind of an interesting idea. She, it appealed to her artistic sense of having a room like that. And uh, it, so it turned out that the only room available <laughs> for us to do that was this small uh, library room, we call it, in the house. And so uh, she found this artist uh, who specialized in creating these uh, unusual environments with, with gold paint and um, a very interesting process. So it was kind of nice to have this room that in this house that uh, you know, used to have a, when we bought the house, it had a radio that it was uh, tuned to uh, civil alert, I remember, you know, for just in case there was the, an atomic attack, you know. And I remember thinking, we got to get this radio out of this room. And years later, uh, we brought this artist in who then transformed this room. Inside the room is a couple of very unique 
pictures of uh, Jimi Hendrix as well. And uh, although it's where all the domestic stuff goes on, you know, all the stuff you got to keep for adult life and all that kind of stuff, it is the golden room. And so I just decided to go in there and come up with a song, uh, sort of play into it. And this kind of goes back to the, the, the woman that asked me the first question about process of writing. And, you know, I really do surrender myself to the emotion and the, or the, even if it's just a pure intellectual thought of the moment. And, uh, you know, I, I wrote uh, the phone call when, when we were trying to figure out where to go to dinner or something, you know, and I just sort of made a mountain out of a molehill about something. I wrote The Crush of Love when she called one day and she, she, she said she had to work late. And so I thought, well, what if I was, you know, all alone and she wasn't gonna come home or something like that and I just focused on that like it was a prayer or something or something that I couldn't get out of my mind like a thought loop right and out of it came enough constant musical concentration to write a song you know that was different from the others so that's what I did in this room distressed it's not real gold, obviously. It's just gold paint. But great process, though. Three coats of paint, white, chocolate brown, then this gold, and then she'd go around and distress it. And it was great to watch the artist at work. Um, but then we wound up with this gold room and the Hendrix pictures in there and everything. So it kind of inspired me to, uh, to write that. And then, of course, in the studio, it was just, you know, those guys, Mike Keneally, uh, uh, Alan Whitman and Jeff Campitelli, they really rose to the occasion and made a very special song. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Hi. I'm Angelina. I'm from Oklahoma. Hi. Um, I'm sure as an artist you have faced a lot of adversity and a lot of naysayers, uh, especially for someone who's a musical outsider in the industry, one who goes against the grain. Yeah. Um, was there ever a moment since the first time you tried to pursue music until you I guess you, how you would think you made it, whatever that means to you. <laughs> um, was there ever a moment that you had like paralyzing doubt to hard, the hard times and how did you get through it? Yeah, I, th I would have to say I was lucky enough to have a support group, good friends, good family, who would always say, it'll pass, you'll get over it, try again, you know? And so that it was installed on me never to give up. But yeah, I mean, I think, I've enjoyed wallowing in the depths of despair uh, because sometimes it just feels like the one thing that is the best thing to do, you know, is to say it's nobody understands and uh, they're all against me, which is a perfect moment to write a song, by the way. Yeah, you know, and this is something that people want to hear, by the way. They really, people want to hear, well, let's put it this way, musicians, composers, we have a gift that we can turn these little things that everything, everybody goes through into pieces of music that, that wind up accompanying them in life. They can use it to celebrate or commiserate. It's an important thing when you think about it. I remember music from when I was a kid and I'm, I still hear it in my head. When I hear a song, that I heard when I was six years old or something in the back of a car or I heard in the hallway of, uh, of high school. It just, you know, it brings back that instant memory. So the music that we're making, that you might be making today, is gonna find its way into the hearts and minds and, and memories of the general public. That's actually what we do, it's pretty intense. Not to scare you into thinking, oh my God, this next note is the most important note ever, but it, in a way, it's, it's that easy. In other words, your original, your, what you go through is completely unique. All you have to do is write about it and put it out there and move on. And as, as uh, there goes something. Um, I'll write about that later. <laughs> Fascinates me. But um, it's an alien. Uh, what's, what's the thing that uh, Andy Warhol said? Uh, basically, while everybody else is arguing about whether it's good or not, just make more art, which is the best way to do about it. Because you will always, especially today, find people who will have a negative comment about what you're doing. That's just, you know. But don't worry about it. Yeah. It's uh, just, you got to be able to take those lumps. That's for sure. 
Like, like, <laughs> like the YouTube comments that will be scrolling <laughs> down in this as it's being watched. Yes. <laughs> yes, sir. How do we? How are you doing? Yo. Very good. I'm Richie. I'm from Mexico. Um, and over there, well, we admire you so much, you know. Thank you. You have been a, a, an inspiration for all of us, guitarists uh, in Latin America and also, also in Mexico. And well, it would be great if you can send a, a greeting to all uh, the guitarists that are seeing you because we're recording you right now. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Yeah, but, <laughs> but uh, the question is, what piece of advice would you give to all the guitarists that at some point, uh, well, we reach a certain point, but we feel like it's stagnated, you know, like we, we've, we need to go beyond that. Yeah, learn something else. Uh, you know, at the G4 clinic we, we just uh, completed in, in Palm Springs, that question came up a lot, you know. So that, that happens to all of us quite a bit. Um, one thing that helped me a lot was doing, learning how to do something that's not like part of my job. Like if I'm preparing for a tour or something like that, obviously I'm working a lot on electric guitar melodies and solos and things. Got to get my stamina up and make, memorize all the music. But I, f I f still feel like I'm at one of those moments where I really wish I could do something different. I will do something different. Like there was a couple of years there where I would practice acoustic guitar, finger picking, you know, for a couple of hours every day. And it's not my thing at all, but I would just do it and do it and do it religiously to try to break through the wall. And every couple of weeks I'd put on a Tommy Emanuel DVD and I'd be reduced to... <laughs> So he's just like a little teeny guitar player. And I go, oh man, you know. So I'd start over again. But it was humbling, but good. Because I, from there, would you know, stuff happens when you're trying. Uh, you know, I think that my experience hunched over an acoustic guitar, you know, picking, I would leave the thought of the finger picking and all that technique and I would just listen to the notes and I'd say, you know, I'd recognize this doesn't happen when I'm doing my show this is something unique, so I'm gonna pay attention to it. And then I wind up writing more music that's based on the experience of the practice, not necessarily what the practice was for. Now, this is a sort of a tangent of, you know, a, tangent, a tangential piece of advice, but um, it, it has to do with showing up, you know. Um, like, I don't know what I was gonna do here tonight, I have no idea really. I know you're gonna ask me questions and stuff. But um, I just had faith that something interesting would happen uh, meeting everybody here tonight. So I thought, well, I'm just going to show up and see what happens. And, uh, and it will. I know that when it, later on I reflect on it, there'll be so much for me to take in and to, and to feel good about that I did it. Uh, that has nothing to do with the mechanical part of uh, trying to get across town and sitting in this town and trying to figure out how to look good holding a microphone. Which I, have, hold the mic. I have no practice at. <laughs> but um, so, yeah, so do something different. Get a song book by, you know, an artist that you've never paid attention to and say, I'm just going to learn 10 of this woman's songs and I just figure out what the hell's going on. How come 10 million people adore her? Must be something, right? <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. Hi. Uh, wow. Um, I'm Dominic Sansoni from uh, Ohio, Hi, Dom. and um, I was just kind of wondering if you, if you did or did not have a stack of songs that was a phone book thick, what, what did you do or what would you do when you kind of hit that wall of like not liking anything you did or, or oh, like, you know? yeah, take them apart. That works really great sometimes. There have been uh, great songs uh, sung and interesting books written uh, where people just cut and paste purposely out of order. You know, when they make movies, the editor, after the director and all the actors are finished, the editor has this incredible insight into a film because they're the ones that really see it. And they might sit down with the director and say, you know, she should walk into the room after the dog jumps out of the window, you know? And the director will go, oh my God, why didn't I think of that, you know? And so uh, in the studio, we get situations like that all the time. I was just watching a documentary um, about the Beatles and George Martin was talking about the song Can't Buy Me Love 
that started with the verse. And he started to think as a producer, this is not gonna work for the album starting off with a verse and you saying money can't buy a diamond ring or whatever the, ver the verse is. So he just casually mentions to Paul McCartney, it'd be really nice to start with something bigger. What have you got? And so Paul's going, well, we, we could start with the part of the chorus maybe, can't buy me love, right? He goes, okay, let's try that. So, you know, they're not cut and pasting, you know, uh, on a DAW, but they're, they're doing the same things with their brains and their emotions, and they go out there, and they recut the song, and it becomes a number one hit, you know, and, and it's, so it's not, you know, in that particular case, you've got outside forces, collaborators, you know, coming in. There's no reason why you can't do that while you're by yourself and say, if, if I were George Martin, what would I say? <laughs> you know, I, I might say, hey, Dominic, how about that third song? The bridge is actually better for song number seven. It's just you've never noticed it before, you know. I've certainly done that. I've moved things around. And the only thing you can, it may not be a success, but you will learn something from it. So it's, it's all good. You know, it's all positive, the experiment. Cool. Thank you. Sure. Hi. Hi, Joe. How uh, are you? Good. <laughs> good to see you. Uh, yeah, so I have another writing process question for you. Okay. Uh, so just kind of sort of looking at your career as a whole, just as a fan, like your first couple of records, you'd always have a song or two on them that was short, like Headless or, you know, Hill of the Skull, yeah. Midnight, something like that. Yeah. And then later on in your career, you kind of moved away from that, and there were more just fully built songs and just from my point of view it seems like oh you've just moved away from that kind of writing you don't do that anymore mm -hmm. but then on recent albums like you have butterfly and zebra or solitude or you're you're kind of you know those are creeping back up again mm -hmm. so the question is do you sometimes like you write a melody and you know it's perfect like that you can't build a song around it or is it sometimes you have a melody and you get stuck with it so you release it how it is or does that make sense? Like, I know everything's different. Yeah. Um, first, I have to say, I love the words that you picked. First of all, fully built song. That's, see, now that's something where if you're sitting down with a collaborator or a, or a producer or something and they make a comment like that, you immediately go, well, what do you mean fully built? You mean the other ones aren't fully built? They're just half built or something? You know, it makes you wonder. And then you go back and you go, oh, yeah, maybe I didn't write it. Kind of like with uh, Shockwave Supernova. It's a very interesting thing. You think it's fully built until someone says, no, it's not. You know, go back to the drawing board. Um, I forgot what the other word was, but it's, it'll pop into me later. But um, I think, um, oh, creep. I love that word creep, right? You said the shorter ones cre are creeping up. Mm -hmm. That's really, the imagery is like they're in my backyard or something and they're slowly. <laughs> creeping to my studio. Or, I guess another, another thing to say to get a little more specific, but like your song Bamboo, maybe yeah. to me, if that would have come out 20 years earlier, maybe it only would have been the first minute of the song, <laughs> the, the cool little intro and like it would have. Yeah, I mean, these are great observations. I think what it points to is what's happening to me in life during the course of these albums. And then what happens to me when I'm out on tour with campaigning for the most recent record and, and playing the catalog stuff is I change as a musician and I look at uh, a, a piece like Bamboo and I go, actually, I want it to keep going. I want to see if we can keep going. That song Bamboo was so experimental. I started writing that on this the surfing tour. I remember practicing that on a beach in Miami. That's how old that song was. And thinking, well, this is just isn't enough. It is not fully built. It was definitely not fully built, right? And so I kept it in my pocket thinking like, well, I just someday I'll understand it. You know what I mean? It's like something like your grandmother gives you and you go like, what do I need this for? I'm seven years old. And then when you're 33, you go, ah, now I, I know why she gave it to me. So um, I pulled that out thinking, I think I understand this now. It's just that it needs to be more fully built. I need to pull from the, just that first thing the main information, which was it wasn't a good standalone two-handed tapping piece, which is 
you know, I mean, after Eddie Van Halen, if you do that, you better come up with something, right? Because <laughs> he kind of owns it, right? So you've just, you've got to be so totally different with it. So uh, the idea was, well, I'll tuck it, just make it integral. And uh, the, the funniest part was convincing the other guys in the band to record it because they just thought it was the funniest thing ever. And because I'd say, you know, kind of, you know, on the cymbals and they're just laughing like, I ain't doing that. <laughs> I don't want people to hear me play like that. So we kind of made fun of it a little bit so I could just get them to do the bit, you know. And then Jeff didn't want to play the groove at the end uh, at all. And then, uh, I, you know, it was one of those things where he came in, like, I don't know, 1030 in the morning. And I said, just go out there and just do whatever. Just be funky, you know. And it was one take. And he just played, you know, I think he was really pissed off at me that I made him do it, but it was the thing that the song needed because the solo was backwards. And I got a little bit of flack from that because the album should have had a real solo, a fully built solo, right, <laughs> at the end of the song. But I, but I was like, that's not really what its song is about artistically. And the album, I felt, really needed something really strange to finish it with. And it was Kaz Utsunomiya that my A&R guy from Capital at the time, kind of that whole Epic Records, I mean, Epic Records, Sony thing was kind of weird, but he was my guy at the time and he wouldn't let me touch it. He just thought it was beautiful and he said it should, it should be that way. That's how you should end the record, so. Thank you. Sure. Yes. <laughs> Hi. Um, I was wondering how many guitars do you have and which one is your favorite? <laughs> <laughs> Do you want one? Do you want it? Because I'll just send them to you if you. Oh no no no! I I was just curious. <laughs> uh, I think that we've. I knew that would just. It took a while to sink in, right? That's the music industry for you. You just offer guitars to people, and they're like, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> Probably somewhere between 100 and 200, and, and then, you know, we give a lot of guitars away every year, so the numbers keep, you know, they're fluctuating by 10s, 20s, and 30s. A lot of, most of them are Frankenstein guitars, because I'm always designing, for 30 years now, guitars with Ibanez, so there's like 10 really ugly, like way, way out crazy versions of the model that we finally settle on, and uh, I thank them every day for following my weird ideas like what if you put the pickup there and and you know and we use plastic you know we made guitars out of recycled detergent bottles one year i thought it was a good idea they they sounded Beats cool them landing in the bottom of the ocean yes they and and they weighed a ton smelled really great too <laughs> it's just hard to market you know what i mean but um i do have favorites uh, but then I retire them and I make myself have new favorites. That's just what I decided to do. If I was gonna, you know, put on some weird clothes and pose in front of a camera with a guitar, I figured I better take this thing out on tour and show people that it really works. I'm not just gonna hold anything, you know. It's so embarrassing to do those things, but uh, it's, so I take new guitars out on the road for a campaign or two, they get retired and then I, I move on to the next model. Thank you. Hi, how's it going? Hi. I'm Marcial from Cuba. Uh, Hi. I heard that you like having Sabione in your dressing room. <laughs> <laughs> that is the funniest thing. Where could you have possibly heard that? Uh, from a friend of yours, Simon Phillips. Right? Oh my God, that's so funny. That started when we were on tour with Mick Jagger's either either in Japan or, or Australia or somewhere. Maybe it was just rehearsals in New York. If somebody decided to order Zabion at the end of the meal and uh, we all started singing it and it became this chant. One person would say it, Zabion, Zabion, Zabion. And we'd go up and we'd see how, you know, how weird our upper partials would get on the chords if we get a minor 13th chord or something like that. Um, and uh, they, the restaurants never enjoyed us doing that because we do it over and over again. You have a couple of those sugar rush, alcohol rush, everything, you know. So, yeah, but that's too sweet and sticky. I never drink before a show. I can't play when I have alcohol in my system. I don't know what it is. It's just my timing goes right out the window. 
<laughs> and I'm the only one who enjoys it. That's the scary part. <laughs> I learned that early on when I was in high school that every great gig that I had was all in my mind, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, so I would never have that before a show. Maybe after a show, but yeah. Have you ever had it? No, never oh. before. Is there a place in LA where we can have it? It's an unbelievable dessert drink. I don't know what you call it, but you know, egg whites and all sorts of delicious stuff put in there. What a great idea. Basically nowadays, like, you know, there's so much information out right now on the internet and there's so much music going on. How do you see the future of music and how do you think the new generation should think about what we should really be focused about and what should be our really main things that we should never step away from to find uh, our you know, Well, goals. first of all, you should not listen to me, right? Because I'm 62 years old. I'm just totally, you know, I'm just like from another generation. You can, you know, take in these stories and they can be amusing and maybe mine little bits of information. But as far as actually doing something, you're the right age to respond to what's happening. I think young people today, their minds will expand to, uh, to meet the challenge of re today's reality, just like every generation has. You think about it, you go back. If there was a problem with the new generation not being able to handle the new thing, we wouldn't be here. It would have stopped like about 89,000 years ago, right? Uh, so, yeah, new humans get new abilities. You just grow into it. This is your world. I'm still surfing it a little bit, but <laughs> this is, uh, you know, I, to all young people, they just take control. This is their world, you know, and, and uh, d definitely don't, I, I don't want to say don't listen to us, but I guess I just said it. Well, and, I mean, <laughs> and your, your vibe, your surf, it's going to live on through younger generations also. It's a, it's a cohabitation, you know. Nicki Minaj song with the Satriani music in it, like, you know, who could have predicted that? No, it was certainly not me. <laughs> but she did ask first, which was very nice. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. So it was I'll all legal, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, thank you so much for coming out on a Thursday night and staying late with us. Thank you very much, Sorry, everybody. Sorry we couldn't thank get to everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Satriani, thank you so much. Thank you.